Even though the electromagnetic spectrum is extremely long, our eyes only see an incredibly narrow band which we call the optical spectrum. If you've watched this channel for a while, you'll know that I love projects that let us artificially extend that spectrum and see the world in new ways. Last year, with the help of my friend, I built my first radio telescope and it let me take a picture of the sky in microwave frequencies, around 18 gigahertz. Our sky is full of satellites these days, but there's a special orbit known as the geosynchronous band that if you park a satellite there, to us, looks like it stays in the same spot in the sky. Really, this just means that it rotates at basically the same rate as the Earth. When we took our microwave picture, we could see this band and we were even able to pick out which satellite some of the bright spots were. Since then, I've been dreaming of doing this again, but with a far improved setup with greater capability. But this time, rather than looking at 18 GHz signals, the system would be built to see 2.4 GHz signals, which is what Wi-Fi uses. In this way, the goal was to take a picture of a building and see where the Wi-Fi sources were. And over the last three weeks, you've seen the progress of that build. If you haven't, I've linked to the previous two videos where we first built the main structure, antenna, and upper assembly, and then built the lower assembly, got everything moving, and started working on data capture. This week is the moment you've all been waiting for, and now that we've worked out all the bugs, it's finally time to take those Wi-Fi images. First, let me set the stage. I'm here at FooLab, the only true hackerspace in Montreal. Our first test will be inside the space, since the router would be as close as possible and we stand the best chance of seeing something interesting. In one corner is the server shed where the Wi-Fi router is housed, and if this works, we expect to see a bright spot there. The rest of the room should be pretty quiet. Paul, one of the members that helps run the space, has been a huge help with this project, and it wouldn't have been possible without him. He wrote the script that controls the robot and tells it how to move, and he runs that on his computer. I'm in charge of the radio end of this project. We're using my HackRF to be our radio receiver so that it can function at these frequencies. The cheaper RTL SDRs max out before this, so a HackRF or one of the higher end SDRs is actually required. I'm running a script I built in GNU Radio based off a tutorial I found that tunes the HackRF to the frequency we want, determines the power of the signal, and then sends that data as a float over a network port to Paul's laptop, where he captures the data and syncs it up with the movement. The way his script is written, it tells the robot to take a step, then records 250 milliseconds of the power data and writes it to a file. Then the process repeats, the robot takes another step, and then another 250 milliseconds of data is written to a new file. Once the robot has finished taking all of its steps, all of the collected data can be processed separately. Each of the files are parsed, and all the values collected inside are averaged to a single value, so that we can determine the signal strength at each location, or pixel, represented by each file. The values in the files are in decibels, usually ranging from 24 to 45, which isn't super helpful to make an image. So once they're averaged, they get scaled by first dividing them by 100 and multiplying them by 255, so that they range from 0 to 255. These numbers can then be plot into a matrix and finally converted into our image by using the same number for each of the RGB channels. This way, our image will be nice and colorful rather than black and white. This will make it a lot easier to see details that stand out. For our first image, we set up the robot on the desk and aimed it just to the right of the server room. This way, we should see mostly dim pixels before the giant spot, and we set it to rotate about three quarters of the way around by the end of the program. It took almost two hours, and by the end, we'd captured 5.7 gigabytes of data. Unfortunately, the data stream cut out a little bit before the end because a cable had come loose, but we still managed to capture most of it. Then Paul went to work processing all of that into an image. It took a little bit of tweaking and playing with the data to get things working, but when all was said and done, sure enough, out popped a colorful image. And to our amazement, there was a giant glowing spot right where we expected it to be. I took that image into Photoshop to properly scale it, and then took a panorama with my phone from the same spot so that we could overlay the two. The bit I find the most interesting is that there was more than one spot in the image. Just to the left of the main spot, there was this mysterious band. We started looking around to see what it was, and sure enough, there was a little router that we'd completely forgotten about hidden amongst the web of cables on the desk. We took another smaller image, but this time aimed in the opposite direction at the room next door, and again, we saw a bright spot. I think this is actually the neighbor's router, as seen through the wall. We've been waiting for them to be in so that we can ask to see if that's actually where they keep their router. Either way, knowing that the system was working, it was finally time to take an image of a whole building. For this, the setup had to be a bit more complicated, since it was too far away to use our router to send the data between computers. Also, we needed to power everything while outside. So first we had to find every extension cable we could and run them all the way down the hall, out the window, and onto the roof. Then, after moving all our equipment outside, careful not to drop anything or fall as we were crossing between the world's rustiest fire escape and a drop to certain death, we could start assembling everything. To pass signals between the computers, we used a gigabit router and ethernet cables so we had a nice and fast wired connection. This meant reconfiguring our ethernet settings, but only took a minute, and after that, the rest of the setup was mostly the same. From our vantage point on the roof, we were essentially surrounded by buildings. 
Our building flanked us on three sides, and across the courtyard were some residential buildings. This time we set the robot to do a proper 360 degree pass and aimed it across the courtyard to start with. After making sure all the wires were in the most optimal position so they won't get caught as it turns, checking the connections, double checking the data flows between the computers, and doing the final countdown, I started sending data and Paul told the robot to move. And nothing happened. As usual, I'm a turnip and forgot to turn the robot's power supply on. After a quick reset and another dramatic countdown, we went through the start sequence again, and sure enough, this time the robot sprung to life. After a brief bit of staring at it to make sure it wasn't going to spontaneously combust, we went inside to play enough Beat Saber to kill the four hours it would take to capture our full image. When all was said and done and the program had run its course, we packed everything in and brought it inside to process the data. All in all, we'd captured 44 gigabytes of data this time. Turns out that gigabit connection actually let a lot more data through. So instead of the 500 kilobyte files we were getting the first time, these ones were coming in at 4 megabytes each. But when we went to process all of it, we realized there was an issue. This time, when the program spat out an image, there was nothing there, just noise. This really threw us off since it had worked so well the first time. Turns out there was a glitch in the program, so instead of taking all of the values in the files and averaging them, it had only been using the first value. This meant that we'd just gotten extremely lucky when we took our first image, and the first values just happened to work out into a nice image. After another couple hours of Paul bashing his head against the code, he'd finally managed to make it behave properly. This was when we found out that to actually process all of the data was much more process intensive when you're actually using all of it. So instead of the 15 seconds that it took to run it the first time, when we reprocessed our first image, it took 6 minutes. And processing this latest one took a whole hour. And that was after Paul had rewritten the program to multi-thread the processing steps so that it was using all four cores of the CPU. But this time when an image popped out, sure enough there were the distinct spots that we were expecting. Earlier, while we were waiting, I'd taken a panorama from the same location as the robot so that with this new image in hand, I could jump into Photoshop to combine them again. And the results were outstanding. Sure enough, there was a nice bright spot that was directly in line with the router of the hackerspace. But more than that, it wasn't the only one there. Each spot we could see was essentially lining up perfectly with one of our neighbors. The ones on the left, for example, lined up with units that we knew were offices. And best of all, we could even see some distinct spots coming from all the way across the courtyard. We'd actually done it! Our little robot, who we've named Cogsworth by the way, is actually able to see many of the Wi-Fi routers in a building without so much as a single amplifier to boost the signal. I'll be honest, I slept really well that night with a big smile on my face. This was a project that's been kicking around in my brain for almost a year now, so it was awesome to see it come to life. For those of you interested in trying this yourself, I've put a bunch of links to resources in the description. The most important one is a link to the GitHub repo where we've put all of the code that handles every part of the robot. This includes the script used to drive the robot, the GNU radio program that captures the data, and the script Paul wrote to process all of it. Now you may be wondering, what's next for our little robot? Well, we have a few more tests we want to try with it, but for the most part we're starting to look at building its bigger brother. Before we do, we're going to try and get onto the actual roof and retune Cogsworth to a slightly higher frequency of 3 GHz. The reason being is that the Canadian Weather Service uses radar at that frequency. I think with an amplifier, we should be able to pinpoint where some of those transmitters are relative to us, which could be really cool. We also want to give him a chance to try and take some sky pictures and maybe see that geosynchronous band again, but honestly I think he might be a little bit too small. Our next telescope will be built to have its antenna subbed out so that we can do a variety of projects that require different frequencies. I think first up will be a hydrogen line telescope, and then after that we can explore tracking satellites and pulling data from them. We're also looking at building a phased array using cheap Wi-Fi Yaggies to really boost the signal and see what we can do with it. Eventually, I'd like to build an even larger setup to see pulsars, but that will be a huge project in and of itself. If you enjoyed this video series and want to support the show and these cool projects, then the best way to do that is, of course, to head over to my Patreon and consider becoming a supporter. Or you can head over to my store on Redbubble and snag one of these My Other Cameras in Space t-shirts I designed. I post videos every week, so if you'd like to see all the projects I've got planned for the future, be sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and most importantly, ring that bell. If you love this channel and want to see it grow, then be sure to share this video on all the various social media platforms. And of course, leave me a comment with what projects you think I should do next. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.